I'm Steve Clemens. I direct the American Strategy Program here at the New America Foundation. And I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, uh, have a good friend, a uh, supporter of New America, here who's been, who's, who's been with us many, many times to talk about economic policy, how he sees the component parts of the American and global economies, and what serious things we can do about it. Uh, and of course, I'm talking about Leo Hendry. And I want to say a few words about Leo and about two uh, commenters as well before we, we get going and, and hopefully get to a real discussion we, we have. And I think anybody who looks at <clears throat> the, the newspapers today sees some fundamental tensions going on between America's ability to continue to generate value, wealth, ideas, manufacturing products, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and, it, and, and a different arena. Uh, which I think has been ascendant until recently, which is the sort of notion of a triumph of capital, a triumph of derivatives, a triumph of sort of building capital on capital without looking at the underlying uh, uh, parts of intellectual capity, capital and, and, and uh, uh, just sort of the, the, the real productivity of, of, of an economy. I've been working for many years with Cheryl Schweninger, who directs our economic growth program, Michael Lind, who uh, uh, was one of the co-authors here of our book, The Radical Center, that also went into a lot of these key questions about what is the best track for American policy in terms of reinvesting in itself, and how do you get high multiplier investments. And I would, without being biased or partisan, think at least until, until recently, we've had more of an absence of economic strategy than we've had any strategy at all. Uh, uh, in the current administration. So Leo Hendry, who many of you know is one of America's leading telecommunications executives, the former uh, CEO of AT&T Broadband and the Yankee Entertainment and Sports Network, or the Yes Network. Um, he was, of course, uh, here recently with a panel of folks and about 300, 300 people uh, uh, all wanting uh, uh, his autograph. Uh, at uh, a gathering of economic advisors to the presidential campaigns when we had the advisors to John McCain, John Edwards, uh, Hillary Clinton, and Barack Obama. And uh, Leo, Leo Hendry uh, literally did steal the show there, for those of you who were there. But he was the most quoted when you looked at the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Post coverage. Um, Leo got the most column inches. Uh, and he's important. Today he has uh, thrown his uh, uh, support behind Barack Obama, and he has supported uh, Barack Obama, uh, or spoken on his behalf, but today he's not doing that. He's, he's speaking here as Leo Hendry. That's the only way. I don't want him being Barack Obama or John Hendry. Talk where you want to go, but I want this all to be Leo. We also have with us Bruce Stokes. Bruce uh, is, of course, the international economics column, columnist for National Journal. Uh, he is a uh, uh, fellow with the German Marshall Fund. He is uh, also an old friend. And, and one of the reasons I invited Bruce here today is he invited me to be part of a study group some time ago that began to look at the tensions between this evolving global, what people were calling kind of, you know, this ethereal new economy on some level, but then what was going on in the real economy with manufacturing and, and uh, trade. And Cheryl Schweninger, uh, who is director of New America's Economic Growth Program, uh, is also the author of the notion uh, of a global middle class and thinking through uh, strategies for onshoring and also addressing the question of American middle class. And so uh, Cheryl is joining us here, here today. I'm pleased to say that um, all of New America is sponsoring this, but, but in particular the next, our next social contract program, uh, which is, has just been launched, it's a very important part of the New America Foundation, is supporting today's event along with the Economic Growth <coughs> Program. I'm here just for show and to keep the trains moving. Without further ado, please help me welcome Leo Hendry. <laughs> you can take the podium, Leo. It's better for the camera. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, this is always fun for me, and uh, I thought that the perspective that I, I would try to take today is, is what role or not uh, the economy has in the 08 campaign. Uh, all of us remember so vividly the, the phrasing in, in 92 where it's, it's the economy stupid. I, I'm stunned that it is not yet the economy stupid in the 08 campaign. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk about uh, actually yesterday as, as a bit of a primer of, of both my concern and how I see the election playing out. As, as Steve was nice enough to say, I, I did have the privilege of being John Edwards' senior economic policy advisor, and, and Barack Obama has been kind enough to let me act as a surrogate on his behalf w without the formality of, of what I did for John. And, and I want to talk a little bit about John Edwards because John Edwards made a, a, a 
very precise bet that it was in fact the economy stupid. Uh, we had a very foreboding sense of this economy. Uh, he spoke about it on the day of his announcement. He specifically chose the city of New Orleans to announce his candidacy and when he pulled out in February it was quite clear that we had not yet proved the case that it is in fact the economy. Uh, and yet the economy as it sits today, as I'll ex discuss, is, is factors worse, uh, factors worse than it was in 1992. And yet we sit here in, in uh, April, early April of 08, and it is by far not yet the economy stupid. And, and a theme that I'm going to get back to is, is something that, that is of grave concern to me because it, it, it has great import to how these issues might play out. But sadly, the American people are, are they're, they're, they're befuddled by the illusions of this economy. And, and as a consequence, it, it has not risen to the stature it might be. Let's look at where we are and are not in this, in this election. Uh, we have not had a single discussion other than an LGBT debate on social issues at all. Uh, we don't talk about race except as it, as it applies to the Reverend Wright. Uh, we don't talk about the social issues that were so dominant in 04. They're nowhere on the political landscape. Uh, Iraq. Uh, is, is not really uh, an issue in this campaign in the sense that, that, that both sides are, are quite clear as to where they stand. Uh, it, it is, you know, everybody has concerns about October surprises. Uh, everybody has concerns about how this surge will or will not play out. But it's clear that in the heartland, this one's not going to be decided, at least in my opinion, on Iraq, although it certainly is a moment. It's not about global warming, that, that we've tried that issue and, and it got very little standing. It may be about health care, but it's hard to tell here in April. Uh, it may become an issue uh, that is, is a moment uh, as we draw nearer to November. It is not yet an issue. It's an issue, uh, it was an issue among Democrats uh, going after each other one to the other, but it is, it is not. Uh, yet, uh, in the eyes of the American electorate, the defining issue of the 08 campaign. It's certainly not trade. It's too, too nuanced. Uh, we've tried that. Uh, we, we believe it should be an issue, but again, very nuanced. And, and a lot of us thought and continue to think that it should be about the state of the domestic economy. If it continues to be as befuddled as it is today, however, I think that John McCain's opportunity to become president falls into the 50-50 category. If it becomes resonant, uh, then I think Senator Obama, who will be the nominee, I believe, uh, his percentage opportunity rises well above that to the 60-40 range. But if it stays below the radar, as it seemingly is today, uh, I think the, uh, the campaign will be very, very tough. Uh, for the Democrats versus the Republicans, and I, I'm saddened by that, but I, I, I believe that. Uh, yesterday was, was, was a primer for, for the level of my concern, and as I walked up the aisle, one of you was reading the Financial Times. If you look at the FT this morning or the Wall Street Journal, it, it, it euphorically spoke on the front page, both of them, about the rise in the market yesterday of roughly 3.2 percent in the Dow and the Standard & Poor's Index. Next to it, at least on the Wall Street Journal's front page, was a, a statement that auto sales are plummeting, down 12 percent uh, for the nation as a whole. So the market is rising by 3.2 percent in a single day. And oh, by the way, auto sales are down uh, 12 percent. Uh, UBS and, and another one of its European counterparts wrote off an additional $23 billion yesterday, an additional $23 billion, and the market rose. Uh, I have argued that the universe of potential losses here is something on the order of $850 billion. Through the announcement yesterday, $215 billion in total has been recognized. So something on the order of a quarter of the, uh, of the hurt, the potential hurt has been recognized and yet the market popped yesterday. I think the entire 850 is, at gra is gravely at risk. I think that, 
any premise that somehow yesterday was some sort of bottom uh, for the financial institutions is, is really quite, quite absurd. There's at least $600 billion, in my opinion, uh, likely to come in whole or in part. Uh, many more mortgages. Uh, a fraction of the mortgages have filtered through the system. A lot more consumer debt. There's a lag in that. Uh, something called uh, CDOs, or collateralized uh, uh, deposit agreements, a massive number, uh, and, and, and a lot of leverage loans in the, in the corporate community. Uh, we have four million mortgages gravely at risk out of, out of a universe of 55 million in this country. 51 million are, are outside of, the, of the, the scope right now of distress but less than a quarter of the four million that are in grave risk have actually rolled through the system. Uh, stagnant wages, uh, uh, North Carolina, I was there last evening, North Carolina is a, uh, a big part of the upcoming primary schedule. It's one of the big four of the next 10. Uh, wages are down 11.3% since 2000, median household income down 11.3%. The country as a whole is down. 2% in six, seven years. Pennsylvania, uh, worse than that average. Uh, Indiana, worse than that average. Uh, trade deficit, even with the weak dollar, still going to be more than $700 billion this year. Uh, something that is very telling is we have had a, an incremental growth in the last seven years in GDP point to point of about $4 trillion yet we have seen federal indebtedness rise, announced federal indebtedness rise itself by four trillion. We've seen consumer indebtedness rise by seven or eight trillion. And we've seen the states, half of the states, 25 of the 50, finding themselves in, in grave distress right now in, in a budgetary sense. And we are not accounting for this war in any practical, reasonable sense. And yet the Dow, as I said, uh, the Dow was up yesterday 3.2%, 319 points on the Dow. So what does it means, mean for November? Uh, it means that Americans, as I said, are simply too easily seduced. Americans are simply too easily seduced by the illusions, the illusions, not the realities of the U.S. economy. Uh, uh, th there's a, several questions ahead for this campaign. Is, uh, is Senator McCain uh, the candidate, is he Bush three, or can he keep himself away from the Bush legacy? And, and that's going to be an amazing challenge for him. He most days runs as if he is uh, uh, Bush three, uh, and, and yet he uh, uh, will run into great difficulties, I think, if, he, if that is the label that sticks. Uh, can Obama and Clinton, uh, either of them who has the privilege of being the Democratic nominee, can they make the domestic economy the it issue? Uh, if they cannot, as I said earlier, I think the, uh, uh, the opportunities for the Democrats fall, fall down appreciably and it becomes a genuine horse race if they cannot. Uh, th the re-regulation card and, and how it's played by the, the, the presidential candidates is a big, big issue. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's something that, that we didn't do a, a very good job of, I think, in the Edwards campaign. Uh, we saw these problems and we invited government to have a larger role in their resolution, and yet we didn't disabuse the electorate of their pervasive concerns about government. They don't like the role that government plays because I think it plays it shabbily and inefficiently. And what we probably should have done is acknowledged that concern earlier, articulated how better management of government could sustain an ongoing role for a, a more regulatory posture by the government. Uh, I think that, that Senators Obama and Clinton will have that same issue here in the weeks ahead. Uh, this, this economy, as I said, is a complete mess. Uh, it is not anywhere near its bottom. Uh, I don't envy the, the man or woman who gets to be president on January 20th, given uh, the difficulty of, of the fixes ahead. Uh, and uh, it's going to take a massive role for government to turn it around 
and, and both of these candidates on the Democratic side are going to have to imbue the body electorate uh, with more confidence in the government as, as a tool of fixing than, than we did, I think, in the Edwards campaign. Uh, a big issue is who's going to get credit uh, for the 21st century economy, the 21st century regulatory framework. Uh, is it going to be the likes of, of Bernanke and Paulson and Congress, or is it in fact going to be the presidential nominee slash candidate's opportunity? Uh, my guess from the papers today is we are a long way uh, from from it being the federal presidential candidate issue that I think it needs to be. Uh, even this morning, you, you get just such a sense that it, they're not giving either Senator Obama or Senator Clinton uh, the opportunity to make this fix their issue. Uh, there, there's a, 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 muddy, a muddying going on between Congress and, and uh, the vestiges of this administration. Yet, yet very precisely last week, I had the privilege of watching him do it, uh, Senator Obama, for one, and, and, and no less credit should go to, to Mrs. Clinton, both of them did lay out a very precise, uh, I think a little more so in the case of Obama, but both very precise regulatory framework for this economy. A premise that the old rules don't work in the new economy and, and yet, if you, you get a sense five, six days later that, and, and you watch Pennsylvania and, and North Carolina and Indiana, uh, it's, it's not working quite, quite well as it should right now. Right now, it's a draw. Uh, I said to Steve and, and, and Cheryl and Bruce as we were walking in that what was in, what's interesting to me is the breadth of these challenges uh, and, and we all know well how President Roosevelt reacted uh, in the 100 days of his first uh, uh, administration. But we need to spend more time looking back at the Hoover-Roosevelt contest itself, which was stark. And for reasons that, again, I think will be fun for the several of us to share with you, and, and, and Steve, I'd like to sort of finish on that, on that, just throw it out there because we'll get to it here in a bit. Uh, the starkness of this campaign on the economic issues should be much greater than even Mr. Roosevelt found in his contest with Mr. Hoover. It's not there yet. Uh, so it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just such a confused landscape. And yet, I, again, as I, as I did a bit, I can tick off degrees of concern, facts about this economy that are so perilous, so difficult to address, so difficult to fix, uh, I can't figure out, and I think that's what we might have fun with today, is, is why isn't this the political issue of the moment? Because it sure should be. Thank you very much. Thanks, Leo. <coughs> Let me ask Bruce Stokes to uh, <coughs> next. Thanks, Stephen. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, especially with Leo, whose work I uh, have come to uh, admire, um, and uh, with Cheryl, who, uh, whose work I have uh, uh, followed for a number of years and uh, uh, have drawn inspiration from. Uh, Steve asked me to, uh, to try to think about how we frame what the debate should be about the future of the economy. Uh, so a little, in, in a, in a, to a certain extent, this is looking beyond the election because I think that unfortunately uh, it's a little late, uh, as Leo suggested, uh, to, to do some of this framing in this election cycle. But it does seem to me that one of the challenges we face is uh, drawing on the lessons that we're now experiencing with financial capitalism and the downsides of financial capitalism. Um, uh, after a period of, of hu the huge success ex excesses possibly of financial capitalism, but certainly a view as successes. How do we think about the future of this economy? What role does agriculture play? What role does manufacturing play? What role does finance continue uh, to play? Um, and how do we frame this for a political discussion? Because it does seem to me uh, there is the danger that those who talk about manufacturing in particular 
uh, are seen as fuddy-duddies. They're seen as people who are looking backwards. They're seen as people who are uh, th still trapped in the old way of thinking about the, uh, the economy and not some new fanciful technological slash financial capitalism a way of thinking about the economy. Uh, so that's what I'd, I'd like to talk about if I could. Um, I think we need to approach this with some degree of, of humility. Uh, uh, we have certainly underestimated the capacity of an economy to function quite well with a, a shrinking manufacturing base. I think if we'd had the same discussion in the 1970s and we had projected what the manufacturing base of this economy is today, we would have said that's unsustainable. That just won't work. In fact, it has worked. I think we have to acknowledge that up front. The question is, can we continue on the trajectory uh, that we are now on? And uh, it seems to me that the framing that we have to do is to look at this in terms of sustainability and also, I would suggest, in terms of <coughs> equity, because I think they're linked. Um, it's important, it seems to me, to think about the future of this economy in ecological terms. And I don't mean environmental terms. I mean to think about it as an ecologist would think about an ecosystem. Uh, ecologists talk about overshoot and collapse, and the example I would choose is to think about ocean fisheries. Uh, we have for years known that we have been overfishing the, uh, the seas. We have progressively destroyed various fish populations. The danger is that we don't learn anything from that. We move on to a new fish population after having destroyed, destroyed other fish populations. Uh, depleting <coughs> the seas, creating a, a, an increasingly unsustainable environment. Uh, but we never learn a lesson from that. And the lesson, it seems to me, we learn is that you don't know you have overshot the mark until it's too late. And then reestablishing re that balance is increasingly difficult. And we, as a people, we as a, as a society, as an economy, tend to just move on. And we don't, we, don't, we don't ever kind of take in the fact that the fish you used to eat in restaurants no longer exist. Why do you have this exotic fish on your menu? It's because that's what's left in the seas. And people 30 years ago wouldn't eat those fish. It isn't because they're new and different and better. They're, in fact, worse fish. But the, the fact is we have adapted to the system. We are, we are progressively adapting to climate change rather than addressing the, the unsustainability of, of climate change. I think that we have in a financial sense in this economy, adapted to the excesses, to the swings this, in this financial economy, enjoyed the upsides, enjoyed the, the, the huge benefits that financial capitalism has created for the economy, and we adapt to the downsides rather than addressing the downsides. And we need to, it seems to me, begin to think about whether the path we on, whether we, the path we on is sustainable, and I would suggest to you uh, that, it, that it is not, uh, even though we don't know where the point is where, where uh, manufacturing becomes so small that we all suffer. I think the reality, what we know, if we think about the economy in an ecological sense, is that we will not know until it's too late, and we should, we should move with prudence forward in terms of restructuring this economy. The other issue I'd like to introduce, though, is equity. It is clear that financial capitalism is winner-take-all capitalism on steroids. It, capitalism, by its very nature, tends to aggregate uh, value-added in the hands of a few people. It happened in industrial capitalism. It happens even more so in financial capitalism. The challenge we face is we learned over time how to smooth out some of that inequity in industrial capitalism through the existence of unions, to, f to force the redistribution of wealth to, to those who, who uh, work in industrial uh, settings, and also through progressive taxation. The problem is in financial capitalism, we haven't figured out how to do that yet, and it, and it may, I would argue, be more difficult. Look at what we tried to do in terms of taxing the benefits accrued by hedge fund operators in the last few months, and how the ability, the, the, the the aggregation of wealth among those, those financial capitalists enable them to block that kind of progressive taxation. I think that, that's, that it becomes even more difficult than it was 100 years ago 
when we tackled this issue in industrial capitalism, to address the, the question of equity. And that brings us back to one of the other rationales, it seems to me, for maintaining some kind of manufacturing base in the society is we know how to deal with the equity issues that are created. We have mechanisms for doing that. We do not have mechanisms to deal with the, the equity issues that are created by financial capitalism, and I'm not so sure we will easily be able to uh, address those issues in a, in, in a fashion that would be sustainable politically in this society. So again, I think we, we need to think about this, this in terms of the sustainability, not only economically, politically going forward. Um, we have to, it seems to me, develop a sustainable and equitable economy uh, through public policy. Uh, Cheryl, I'm sure, will talk about this in greater detail. I would like to merely point out uh, some of the issues we need to think about going forward. We have, in recent years, I would say in the last 20 to 30 years, put a premium on efficiency. Efficiency trumps all other issues. It's an economics concept, obviously, and it's, <coughs> it's highly rational and it's hard to argue against. But what it has led us to is offshoring. It's much more efficient to do much of this off abroad than it is. And it is, has led us to, uh, it seems to me, an unsustainable uh, situation where the costs of that, um, that, that rationality, of that efficiency, have never been adequately addressed. Um, and for that reason, as we go forward, <laughs> We probably can't necessarily um, undo some of the damages that have done in the past. But going forward, it seems to me we have to challenge the questions of efficiency very sharply. Um, equity and sustainability are as equally important as efficiency going forward, whether that has to do with regulation. Um, I've been engaged in the last week in conversations with, with um, uh, experts on uh, central banks and, and financial regulation, and they keep coming back to the, the incredible efficiencies that have been created in financial capitalism over the last few years through the various developments, that, uh, the, the uh, uh, innovations in financial capitalism. Um, and it's clear they are stuck with the importance of that. They can't also have, take, have a, a, a clear view of the ledger that is, that is created, the costs of that. Um, perfect example would be, uh, uh, Leo mentioned 800 some billion he thinks is the cost of this. Um, uh, that is probably at least twice as a percentage of GDP uh, what the right. savings and loan crisis cost us. Um, that is uh, an enormous cost to the system. Now if you press these financial analysts, they will say, well, the efficiency of financial capitalism, the innovations of financial capitalism, add one or two percentage point, one or two tenths of a percentage point to the GDP every year. Well, we're about to knock four or five percent off the GDP in one year. So it does seem to me that we have to, we have to weigh the costs uh, against the benefits. Thinking about climate change, for example, we, uh, if we continue to apply the efficiency rationale uh, that drives the economy now, as we go forward, as we deal with climate change, it makes all the sense in the world to drive carbon intensive industry offshore. Uh, in a cap and trade environment, it is better that that production be done in China than it be done here. But that, it, that does not address the sustainability issues, it does not dis, dis address the, the equity issues, and uh, it may well be, horror of horrors, it would make more sense for us to subsidize the steel or aluminum or the paper or the chemical industry to stay here if we had a true cost accounting rather than move it uh, to China. But those are the kinds of questions we're going to have to face, it seems, going forward in trying to sustain this economy. I haven't talked about a number of things I think that, that uh, Cheryl's going to talk about, uh, things, uh, questions of R&D, questions of infrastructure, questions of education, uh, smart industrial policy. I think all of those uh, remain to be discussed in the, uh, uh, with Cheryl and within the question session. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you very much. Cheryl Schwenninger. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, I, in fact, uh, going to try to provide a little bit more detail, both on 
Leo's theme and then what I think Bruce has started. I, I, I think Leo is on to something very important. There's a great deal of confusion and befuddlement about the economy, and one of the reasons is that we've taken the economy off the political agenda for the last 15 to 20 years, especially, I think, since 1993. So the notion was that the economy has an inevitable uh, dynamic of its own, inevitable logic driven in part by globalization and certain necessities of the, of the times. And the best we can do that is ameliorate some of the worst consequences of the economy or, cons or, or compensate. I'm talking about the political discussion. And therefore, some of the most, decision, most important decisions we made about the economy have actually been made without any political discussion and, 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 dis and decision. And now we're confused because we've never had those debates. Uh, uh, R Robert Reich had an important notion in the mid-80s when the whole notion of an industrial policy arose. And Bruce mentioned industrial policy, a, a term that one dare not use too much in, in DC. And Steve mentioned the absence of an economic uh, strategy. But Bob Reich, I think, was right back in the early 80s to point out whether we like it or not, we have a hidden industrial policy because we do have, a, we're making a whole lot of decisions or policies that affect uh, the productive capacity of the economy of whether it, favor, it favors a certain kinds of financial capitalism or whether it fav favors other sectors of the economy. And so I just want to go through eight or nine, um, and I, uh, I would have gotten 10, but I think I would go over time if I did, did 10, so I'll limit it to, to 8 or 9. Important decisions that we have made about the economy over the last decade or so that constitute a hidden industrial policy that I think have to be revisited as a matter of priority by the, 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 the next administration. And the, 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 the first is, is one that is, is, I start out with an issue that I think is sensitive to, to the Democrats and progressives because it cuts against some of the uh, tendencies within when the party, is that in, a, in effect we made a decision to subsidize low-wage labor and drive a lot of capital into low-wage enter enterprises. And we've done this both with the earned income tax credit which in effect subsidizes certain kinds of labor for certain kinds of enterprises. And we've done it through a fairly loose immigration uh, policy, which makes low-skilled, low-wage labor readily, readily ava available. And we've done this at the expense of, of subsidizing in a thoughtful way what I would call medium to high-skilled professions. And s such today that we don't have it's unthinkable to, to, to have on the government subsidized on-the-job training for millions of, of needed welders, needed, uh, needed uh, mechanical engineers that, with, that don't need necessarily four-year degrees. And so with the benefit of the, of the lower dollar now, there, there is a bit of an industrial manufacturing revival going on throughout the heartland of America. I was in Duluth re recently, and their problem is finding certain kind of skilled workers. There's no government programs uh, that would immediately uh, provide uh, the local air fa uh, small air manufacturing with their ability to train people people and up and running, yet companies really don't want to take on that, that expense. So we've made a conscious decision that we want more low-wage workers, more, more gardeners, more fast food. And you look at, Mike Lind has repeatedly pointed out, if you look at the fastest growing occupations, job creation and hospitality and health care, <laughs> meaning that hospitality is a is a euphemism for waiters, waitresses, et, et, et cetera. So we've, we've had a low-wage industrial policy at the expense of, of medium-skill, uh, medium high-skill 
enterprises, and I think we need to re re revisit that. The second is that we've, <coughs> we've decided to subsidize a failed corporate model in healthcare at the increasing cost of business and, again, capital. We are now crowding 17% <coughs> of our GDP, a lot of investment capital, a lot of uh, increasing uh, 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 at the <laughs> increasing number of individuals that are pushed into pushing paper bureaucracy in the healthcare administration. And what, is, what that 17 percent of GDP represents when the OECD average is, is more closer to 9 to 10 percent is lost, both not lost investment capital, lost human capital, but lost productivity gains because this is the sector that, it, that is least productive uh, in, in the U.S. economy. The problem to boot is that we're not even providing good quality health care or, 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 or universal assets. The, the third decision we've made is that we've favored in our tax system offshoring of productive enterprises. We said if you make domestic profits, if you're a corporate, if you're a corporation, if you make domestic profits, we're going to tax you immediately. If you move your operations offshore and decide not to, to uh, repatriate your profits, you can postpone paying those taxes indefinitely, perhaps permanently. And moreover, if you bribe a few politicians to give you a tax haven, you can repatriate some of them periodically, and so we'll, 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 we'll ump the ante. So the, the logic <coughs> is that now the U.S. has the second highest corporate income tax burden, if you add the state, local with the federal, of all OECD countries, <coughs> which encourages, you know, one of the reasons why you get a lot of the nameplates in Bahamas and other places is that we have too high a corporate income tax. Now, again, this is a problem for the Democratic Party, but cutting the corporate income tax, if we want to encourage onshoring and increased economic activity and the growth of jobs seems to be terribly important in the future. But we also have a tax system that, is, that f has favored the investor trading class rather than the investor producer class. Because what, what the Bush administration did was lower capital gains but have high corporate income tax. So you double tax a lot of what is productive capacity, but you, you make very low the trading and other financial transactions uh, in terms of the tax system. <clears throat> uh, fifth, we've championed uh, trade rules that no longer allow the U.S. One of the secrets of U.S. industrial policy is that we always use the public sector to create demand to help drive innovation or help American local uh, based manufacturers. With the recent <laughs> trade liberalization, we no longer can do that. So now we're in the process, you probably saw the story, that it's not exactly high wage labor, but you have the federal government that is making passports in Thailand. <laughs> if, if in fact you're no longer able, except perhaps for national security reasons, to rest use your public sector to create demand for locally, local-based, American-based corporations and businesses, then you've destroyed one of the essential features of what has been an American industrial policy system for the last 50 to 100, 100 years. And we've done it without any debate whatsoever. Sixth, we've made it more profitable for Wall Street banks and the American financial institutions to recycle other countries' trade surpluses than to supply capital to medium-sized enterprises in the American heartland. So that we've created, we, we made in the mid to early 90s the financial liberalization of other countries, capital markets, and financial services are number one priority, as well as with other deregulation. And in effect, <coughs> what, what that has done is that made the business of Wall Street 
recycling trade surpluses which come into the United States and then either were pushed out because of the excess savings and capital into the home mortgage market or were often repackaged out into uh, investments abroad so that we got a Wall Street that was more concerned about that, that global flow of capital than it was about supplying uh, and, and thinking about how you work with uh, American commercial banks to make capital and credit available to enterprises of one to two to five million dollars that couldn't that w couldn't do IPOs or or couldn't do other other loans. So we have a whole sector of mid-sized companies that have been missing from the American uh, business profile for the last 15 years. Seventh, we've had a global macroeconomic policy, and, and partly by necessity that's made the U.S. obviously the consumer of last resort. And what the effects of that has been to encourage for <coughs> Uh, and because we've also indulged or enabled this sort of mercantilist trade practices of other countries, we've encouraged foreign company upsizing and American company, company downsizing during each world financial crisis. Meaning, <clears throat> after the peso crisis, after the Asian financial crisis, the U.S. market had to absorb the, the export push of the Brazils, the Mexicos, the Thailands, the Koreas of the world in order to facilitate their structural adjustment. That came as the expense. If you remember, I, I'm sure that Bruce wrote about this, all the dumping cases that came in 98 and 99 from American Steel Company. They got hurt badly because Brazil and Korea was, were, were encouraged and forced to dump. The result was American companies responding to market pressures, the federal government responding too slowly to trade requests, American companies downsize during a world economic slowdown. The mercantilist practices of, of Korea and China is to use the financial crisis and, and reinforced by the, by the, the pressures for, for uh, for a, a, a tighter fiscal policy on their part was to push exports into the American market and grab market share at the cost of the American productive capacity. Uh, eighth, we, we spend much more money on the supposed military production of Gulf oil than we do in tapping what, uh, <coughs> what Boone Pickens calls the Saudi, Saudi Arabia of, of wind and solar power in our, own, in our own country. Now the consequences of this is actually s more significant than you would think because <coughs> we, have this n we have relatively high cost electricity power which is what is important for domestic production. If you want to encourage domestic production you subsidize low-cost electricity and local power and have relatively high-cost oil and gas, which increases the cost of transpor transportation. So we have enormous <coughs> uh, solar, wind, and, and oil resources locked up in North Dakota and other places all down the stretch, but we, we don't have the energy infrastructure to deliver that low-cost energy to American producers because we're not doing any investment in energy infrastructure. Which leads me to my last point, an unfortunately somewhat discouraging point, which is that as oh, part of has been so optimistic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, because of the, 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 the greater frequencies of financial crises, it's necessary, therefore, for the federal government to come in and, and uh, be the equivalent of a lender of last resort or to socialize the, the risk that was often taken by the financial institutions. Leo mentioned $850 billion in, in losses. The losses could, with the deleveraging, could, to, could grow. Essentially, we're going to be 
for the next three to five years, moving debt out of the consumer financial private sector onto, in some ways, indirectly and directly the government books. That means that deficits are going to increase. Now, I'm not worried about deficits crowding out private investment because I think interest rates are going to remain low because we're still in a world of excess global savings and liquidity. But what it's going to crowd out is means that we're going to have a public infrastructure less economy for a period of years, meaning that the recapitalization and the bailout of the American financial system, which I acknowledge is absolutely necessary and critical to stop the deleveraging uh, without it, it creating a, a really nasty cascading effect, will probably crowd out many of, the, many of the important investments that we need to make in public infrastructure investment that is critical to rebuilding the productive economy. Now, I, I don't want to make that too definitive of crowding out because I think it's open to political framing and debate, and that's one of the challenges that we will have in the next six months. We should begin with the election, but in the first hundred days that Leo referred to, <coughs> that's going to be one of the most important issues of whether the bailout of Wall Street is going to crowd out other needed public investment uh, in our productive economy and our for middle class jobs. Great, Cheryl. Thank you very much. Now, I think I think we've had three really excellent uh, exposés on very different approaches to some of these fundamental problems. And I'm going to uh, open the floor now, but I want to open myself with one political question for for Leo. And and again, whether it's Barack Obama, John McCain, or Hillary Clinton, but let's just say you know maybe it's Barack Obama wins in November. <clears throat> He's got a, he would have a terrible, terrible situation, you know, taking Cheryl's list of eight or nine points and coming up with any serious scenario to deal with them. But let's propose that he has something like a Clinton-like economic summit. You schmooze everyone from different economic portfolios. You make them feel good, even those who know they're going to lose in the thing. But how do you deal, how, how would you propose that a serious candidate deal seriously with these issues, given the fact that I don't see any way forward without really reshuffling the winners and losers in the equation. What do you do with a new presidency and something like this? Uh, with, and, and, and let's just say there is an understanding that, that it is the it issue, but how do you get the sort of political traction to reorganize and reorder uh, your, your policy framework when you've got to essentially shift away from so many vested interests in the economy, the political economy? <coughs> You know, I, I, th I think that's the political question that the most intrigues me. I, I think if you go back to Hoover Roosevelt, there was great clarity uh, about the contrast between the two alternatives, and thus there was great political mandate. And when Mr. Roosevelt was elected, the hundred days that he was given uh, had the complete endorsement of the American people, or certainly sufficiently to, to, to make them the most effective hundred days. That was actually when the phrase was first created. If the next six months leave it muddied up, whoever is president on January the 21st will not have that mandate and will fail. So while I am, am, am concerned about, as a Democrat, about the outcome of November uh, as a believer in, in trying to get something done here against the litany that, that Bruce gave us and, and Cheryl, I'm saying that these guys, whoever they are, better start getting the mandate because they don't have it right now. They're given, it's too much of a, a muddied up House, Congress, uh, Bernanke, Paulson, you know, no, nobody's getting, nobody's putting the, the, the mantle, the mandate on the next president clearly enough now to cause me to believe that he or she will have the, pol the political public mandate to get these 100 days moving. Terrific. Uh, let me open the floor. Edward Luce, Financial Times. Um, Leo, can I ask you about the befuddlement? Louder, please. The befuddlement. That you and I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, you said that the American voter was continued to be befuddled about the economy. Can I ask you just to elaborate on that? Is this um, some kind of a Marxian false consciousness you're talking about? Or, um, what, what is this? What's behind this befuddlement? And what would be the best political way of breaking through it and getting back to the economy's duty? 
So the question uh, to Leo Hendry was, can he uh, uh, expound a bit on the, the, the befuddlement of the American citizen about these economic issues? You know, I, I think, Edward, the, the, the answer is simply that the financial institutions don't understand the complexity of the problems they've created. And, and that you, you write about that every day, that the boards of directors have been befuddled by what they've created. Uh, I, I watched Brokaw, uh, I'm sorry, Brian Williams the other day, not Brokaw, Brian Williams get seduced as well by saying that this was all about poor people not paying their mortgages. And I don't think the average American understands it when Cheryl and Bruce and I sit up here and say, you know, trade deficit, current account deficit, weak dollar, subsidies, currency manipulation, unfunded Medicare, unfunded Social Security, a, a war that's not being properly accounted for. And they go, holy criminy, I do not understand that. And if they don't understand it, then this president, to the prior question, uh, Edward, does, he doesn't get the mandate. And if he doesn't get the mandate, then the political establishment will eat them up. And I, I, it comes down to that. I just think that, I think Americans are too easily seduced by the illusions and the complexity of the, of the current state of the U.S. economy. When Brian Williams, who's very, very able, says this is all about a few million Americans, poor Americans, not paying their mortgages, and you, you, it's, it's CDOs, it's leveraged debt, it is, it, it's not the consumer's problem. This wasn't created by a few million poor people. Uh, Bruce wanted to make a quick comment. I think we, we also have to uh, remind ourselves that the, the problem that Leo poses is, is not a new one. That almost every election uh, since the 60s, uh, the public has said their biggest concern is the, is, is the economy. And despite James Carville's nice phrase, uh, the 92 election didn't give the Clinton administration that much of an endorsement to do very much. Um, and while it does seem to me that Leo's right, that uh, we desperately need the next president to have uh, the mandate to make major changes in the economy, because this crisis we face uh, is of unparalleled proportions going back to the Depression, uh, I'm not so sure that uh, we're going to succeed at that, as Leo, I think, is not so sure, unless things get an awful lot worse. Because, let's face it, the, the, the reason why Roosevelt had that mandate was that things were, on the ground, much worse than, than they are now. And um, the fact that polls show that people say the economy is the most important issue is, at some level, irrelevant because they don't seem to care that much. They say it's important, but they don't care that much. Harlan, Ullman? A um, couple of brief observations and then a, a question. Um, it's, it's interesting <coughs> that uh, um, Roosevelt's first 100 days didn't work, and our economy was worse in 1939 and 1940, and it took World War II to bail us out. That's not a very happy analogy. I would also suggest that barring some untoward event in Iraq or the economy, the next election is going to be won on character and voter turnout, whether it's Obama or Hillary and McCain, and certainly McCain is running on that. So I think I agree with you that the economy is really going to be in second place here. My question is because you've really focused more on the symptoms than the causes, how do you deal with three of the biggest issues? The first is a question of fiscal and monetary policy that has led to increasing deficits and debts and huge liabilities. You mentioned Social Security, but you've got pension funds, you've got health care. These are growing out of control. So what do your candidates suggest that we do about that? Second, you talk about leverage, which you did not talk about. Not only are the hedge funds, and I'm not talking about uh, monolines and the subprime issue, but you take a look at investment banks and hedge funds, they are leveraged somewhere between 10 to 100 to 1. So the issue is not 850 billion, the issue could be 3, 4, 5 trillion, and you have the possibility of a long-term capital management crisis here times some huge number. So how do you deal with that? And finally, we're in an interesting position of almost having a 17th century equivalent of triangular trade. We import oil, export dollars, and re-import dollars for equity and debt. How do you deal with that? Anybody want to take a quick <laughs> slice? <laughs> you know, I, I don't think we don't have nearly enough time. I think the answer is <coughs> these candidates have solutions to this. 
I think I think that the question that Edward Luce commented, commented on, it, will they have the mandate? I can sit up here and tell you I have a solution because I help John Edwards concoct mm -hmm. solutions for every one of those issues. And I, you know, and, and maybe you'll disagree with our solution, but we had solutions. I know Senator Obama has solutions. Can you the, quickly outline one? Oh, the, the trade policies. I mean, the, the trade policies that that have led to these massive subsidies and currency manipulation. We simply have to stop that. And and uh, in terms of of, uh, of of getting a trade policy back in place, he's been very precise and very articulate. Uh, he has said last Thursday that he had a much more elaborate regulatory scheme than we're seeing from Secretary Paulson in the last 48 hours. Very elaborate. You know, I, I think if, if the scheme that Secretary Paulson put forward is adopted, Wall Street will wipe its brow and say, gotcha. So I, there are solutions out there. The query will simply be in a politicized environment, is Bruce right? Are you right? You said it was secondary in its personality and others. If it's personality, the mandate won't be there. Yes, right here, and then we'll go. Being a chase on OMB watch, and I'm living in a parallel universe. In my universe, the number one political issue right now, and has been for uh, at least two months, is the economy. Iraq, I don't even know if it's second anymore. I can't think. Maybe health care is second. The economy. It is the economy. Uh, already, um, several million people have been brutally affected by the economy. Uh, the presidential candidates have been speaking. I think they were slow to come to it, but they've been speaking every single day and campaigning every single day on the economy. The problem with the current economic policy, proposing new been well covered by the media every day, every day of front page story. Okay. So, okay. Uh, I think that people get it. American voters are concerned and listening to the candidates and making decisions on that basis. In 1932, uh, candidate Roosevelt mentioned the New Deal once all that year, just once, and described it not at all. And yet I would submit he came away with uh, a resounding mandate, not to do what we now know as the New Deal, but to do something. Right. I think that uh, I would not worry um, about whether voters get it, or whether they care, or whether there's going to be a mandate. That's what I submit. But that's, I'm okay. But I, I mean, yeah. I mean, let's, we, we got to, you know, the details matter here. If you ask the American public what to do about the economy, tell, they are deeply Canada divided. Tell, tell, tell they are deeply divided. And this, this, pardon my, you know, Get BS <laughs> about, about bipartisanship is just that. The American public are deeply divided about what to do about specific economic issues, and it's going to be a huge challenge the for the next president the to, yeah, to do that. And oh, look, I cover, I write the, about the economy every day. Right. I want the American people to say it's the number one issue all the time. You're happy. Then. And I should be happy, but I think that we need to be very cautious here. I would differ with Leo in the sense that I think what we haven't heard from the candidates is. Um, a vision of the new American economy that then justifies everything that comes after that. Well, now, but now. to your point, Roosevelt did not do that, and he still changed the role, the nature of government in the economy. He changed the economy dramatically, but to your point, it didn't work until the war. So, you know, we 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 have to begin. Be I think have a certain amount of of, of caution here okay, about just, what you know. Right here. I, actually, fine, right along right. with this stuff. I want to make a couple of comments and then get to it. As so long as they're brief, because we're yeah, running yeah, out of time and I, I, I need less editorial right. and more questions. The 32 election was not about the New Deal. It was a rejection of the Hoover <clears throat> administration. The solution was balance the budget. And you, you and I have had this before. It's different from 32, though, now. Not only are the issues infinitely more complex, but the new president comes to town that is run by special interests. That was not true in 1933. Okay? It is is radically true today. He's not going to have a full complement of helpers for a year. That was not true in 1933. It's a totally different situation. 
Neil, my advice to you is, and I've got to have a question, if you can't get a mandate out of this election, if you can't get people off of bread and circuses and fantasy football and American Idol and everything else, and get them to study these issues and come out with a mandate, the next administration is already a failure. Here's my question. Newt Gingrich has a lot of ideas. A couple of them I like. One of them that I think is really interesting and may be appropriate, I'd like to have your reaction is, why not have a full campaign? that consists of weekly armchair discussions. No no, no one be else in the room. The two candidates, let's hope, two and a half, what are we going to have? Two or three. Talking together about the national problem. Because that's what we don't do. And it, is that a way to get a mandate? And if that were proposed, uh, would Obama or anybody else take up that uh, challenge? Obama would in a heartbeat. I mean, that's that, I mean, that was the, the sad consequence, and I say this just tactically, uh, of not winning Ohio and Texas in the manner that was 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 hoped for, was that you 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 forestalled that for seven, eight, twelve weeks. And you should write a letter to Newt and say I, I'm ready, and I you know, if I can decide to be there every Thursday night for nine weeks, we'll do it. But Newt's not running. <laughs> Newt, Newt, read the website. <laughs> Gaze, if I could Two points. One, a lot of the issues you guys mentioned it seems to me it goes back to the more important decision that's never discussed, which is making the dollar the US the world reserve currency. And as long as we don't change that, you're trapped. Because a lot of the things we're doing basically is to make up for the fact that other people are accumulating dollars. And so we have to generate liquidity, we have to accumulate debt to offset the deflation and impact on the US economy. So half the things you mentioned really are the results of the decision to make the dollar the reserve currency. And that has not been reopened since back in the You know, 70s. you should do an op-ed on this case because what's interesting about the dollar's reserve currency issue is that to some degree that created a gravityless environment for the American economy for a long time that produced lots of interesting results that no other economy in the world could There are a lot produce. of things that we've done bad, but we would have had to do because we had to offset the inflationary impact. That's one point. Second point, uh, Bruce, to your point about Going away from equity, I'm sorry, to efficiency, to other things, right? But I think probably you don't want to put it this way. I think you probably want to say we want equity in the achievement of both economic and social uh, needs. Because, you know, you don't want the image of <coughs> what we got away from through deregulation, which was inefficient bureaucracy, an inefficient way of achieving social and regulatory objectives. So you want to preserve that. You want to say, what we want is efficiency in the achievement of both you know, commercial and private economic goals. And then your point about equity. And here I wanted to come back to, I was very intrigued by an article which said that Obama seems to be moving from affirmative action in racial terms to affirmative action in terms of uh, class and economic terms. And it seems to me that that may hold some promise. I don't know what you all think. Hmm. Uh, Leo, response? Well, I, I, I mean, let, Cheryl can do the first piece better than I by a factor, but let me just talk to you about the latter. I, where Bruce was trying to take you is the imperative of an industrial and manufacturing policy is something that Obama has, has absolutely embraced and understood. This, this, this evolution towards low-end uh, service employment and high-end tech employment leaves roughly half of the U.S. population jobless in in, 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 in in compensatory fashion and and so we the reason we need a manufacturing policy now is we've reached the limits of the demanufacturing of America 56 percent of our population by by aptitude and and by education in a, in a broken education system needs, needs these jobs to be Productive and 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 sufficiently compensated to exist in this society. Sure. Uh, I guess I disagree with your fundamental point. Uh, I don't think the problem is related to the fact that the United the U.S. dollar is a principal reserve currency. In fact, I think the world economy, the U.S. economy, U.S. economic interests depend upon that remaining. Uh, true in, in, in the year, years ahead. I think the problem resorts more from the uh, decisions that were made in the 96, 97, 98 period. 
and that the bubble economy coincides directly with the financial liberalization, push for financial liberalization that occurred in 96 and 97. It culminated in the Asian financial crisis that led, then led to what was called Bretton Woods II, whereby because emerging economies, because of uh, in order to manage their own currency risks, decided to accumulate large foreign currency reserves as a way to try to reassure the international markets. Rather than doing moving towards some of the other ideas of international financial architecture that would have created a, a real international lender of last resort as opposed to moving to coordinated foreign exchange rates. The, U, the, 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 the Clinton administration push, first by pushing uh, first by pushing uh, the the financial liberalization, and then secondly by accepting, in essence, Bretton Woods II, which in effect uh, uh, increased the uh, enormity of the of of the savings of the Asian surplus countries, and allowed other countries to essentially rely upon American monetary and fiscal stimulus, over flooding the American market with with excess uh, liquidity blowing up the asset bubble, uh, allowing the financial institutions then therefore to, to multiply that liquidity, further liquefying the, the various asset bubbles has led to. We could have taken a different path, encouraging other countries as making, making it in an implicit condition of access to the, to the American market. We could have uh, we could have required uh, countries or deterred them from from manipulating their their currencies in that fashion to engaging in more reflationary monetary and fiscal <coughs> policy on on their their own even with the with the u s dollar being in fact the u s would have been in would not have been in a position to demand those things unless the u s had been the reserve currency getting rid of the u s <coughs> as a reserve currency now, if you want the mother of all financial crisis, do that. we would do that <laughs> now. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, um, I'm not an economist, so I wanted to ask uh, this, this question. Uh, after Clinton left office, one of the things he always talked about was all the jobs that were created. Now we come back again, I'm hearing the same arguments that took place long ago. We still hear about Youngstown, Ohio. So what's going on in Youngstown, Ohio, after all these years, all right? right. So now you still have the same problem. We still have the same place of, uh, there's an article on Obama. He went to this town. He had to learn how to speak to white working class voters in the language because change means that they lose their job. So I, I, I'm just trying to figure out where the <laughs> where is the economy going or has gone that these uh, situations that we talked about in the 70s. We're still talking about them today. So what about the Youngstowns and stuff? Youngstown, Ohio, over, over, uh, over uh, the question again. about job creation as a fig leaf on other policy issues. I want to piggyback on that because it's a great question. It's what I was going to talk about. When I was in the Senate working for Jeff Bingaman, uh, I was tasked with writing and good drafting something called the Senate Democratic High Wage Jobs Task Force Report. Tom Daschle had asked Senator Bingaman to do this. We worked with Joe Lieberman and crossed, crossed the aisle, but essentially we had a good swath of the, of the political spectrum in this, in this process and effort. And, and we produced a report that had 80 separate policy initiatives that dealt with everything from education and the offshoring issues, which weren't even sexy yet, to, to a whole variety of issues. And we tried to get the um, uh, Clinton administration to absorb it. We ended up the same thing that you just said. Clinton administration kept talking about all the jobs they were producing and largely wanted to ignore us, except Bob Reich, who stole and plagiarized, and I'll say it on camera, uh, and, I, and I thank him for doing that. We had this idea, uh, for instance, that there was a real problem in the economy uh, in worker retraining, worker continual training, investment in R&D and technology, and you had free riders in the economy which were becoming larger, and you had others that were contributing to the economy that were less, so why not recognize that as a broad public good that some firms are contributing to and some aren't and create a tax benefit for those that are and a tax benefit uh, the other direction or a tax disincentive uh, in the other way. And he called this the responsible corporation. And once you uh, applied a moral benchmark to something, uh, uh, Reich's 
expropriation of our ideas sort of killed it. But the key point was that in 1996, worker anxiety in this country about jobs, the economy was sky high. But the Clinton administration, with all due respect, continued to ignore it and just say we're producing more and more jobs. And this was fundamentally around the time, 95, 96, when the big split came between the Bob Reich view of the world or Laura Tyson view of the world and the Bob Rubin view of the world, in which Laura Tyson sort of joined up with. And, and I share this, this long vignette because it's very important because I was with Laura Tyson recently in Mumbai, India, who seems to be back to her old Laura Tyson self. And I said, what happened to that Bob Rubin period? And she said, that's over. But it does raise this fundamental question beyond Youngstown, Ohio. But it sounds to me like John McCain is the Bob Rubin of the moment. And Obama, to a certain degree, is old Tysonomics. And I'm interested in, in how any of you see this both worker issue, the, the, the Youngstown, Ohio question. But really, are we back to an interesting return to the ideological battle between the Bob Rubens and, and the Laura Tysons and other people who think we need to organize the economy differently? Well, I, I don't think, I think Bob Rubin is still Bob Rubin. And, and the reason I'm, I'm trying to help Barack Obama is I think that there are three answers to this, and, you, and one of them is not education. You cannot educate yourself out of this mess. Uh, it is the greatest corporate head fake in the world. It, it'll take 20 years. Uh, every CEO in the world wants to have the country believe that all this country needs is better education and everything will be fine and they can continue their practices for another couple of decades. It, you need to do three things. You need to have a genuine manufacturing and industrial policy. Uh, you, you, you have to acknowledge that half of the nation's population begs for it and needs it. You have to have trade policies that are fair, that go after most especially subsidies that are illegal or close to illegal in currency manipulation. The American worker cannot compete absent that fix. And the third thing you need to do is have a corporate tax system that complements all of that, that doesn't incent the movement of jobs overseas, the jobs that need to stay here. We are our own worst enemy. Those of us who are older remember Pogo's line, I met the enemy and it's me. Nobody, and this was what Bruce was driving at, I think so eloquently, nobody should be surprised that we are where we are with this litany of actions that we began 15 years ago. This had to be the outcome of those actions. And, and, and the way we went after NAFTA and WTO and PNTR and, and the Wall Streetization of the Democratic Party has left us in this predicament. And the Wall Street Democrat is as much to blame, in my opinion, as any, uh, any complicit Republican who tried to come at it from the other vantage point. Bruce Stroh. I just want to say amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yeah, maybe it's a similar question, but... I didn't see, and also, Joe, Joe, did you have your hand up? I want to make sure I wasn't ignoring it. No? Okay. Yes, sir. But, but you talk about the Wall Streetization of, 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 of uh, you know, the Rubin view and this view. Is there, and, and, the, and also the ability that, that we need the American people to understand the totally inexplicable. They're not going to understand this. I'll never understand it. Oh, no. That's right. If, if, isn't there any interest in, in, in American business from Wall Street in a healthy American economy? Isn't the, don't they see a long-term interest for themselves and their I mean, is it okay for them? So, this continues? So, so, so the question is, isn't, there, they isn't there an the interest in Wall Street? And, say, what, you know, and this is maybe yeah. a naive question. They're waiting no. for China to, to rise and all this. <laughs> but but, but you know, don't they have an interest in, in a healthy American economy? Yeah, so, so the question uh, is, is don't, don't the, the Wall Street financiers have an interest in, in a healthy economy or trans, uh, substituting healthy for what Bruce did is an equitable and a sustainable economy which might be you know monikers for health financiers don't have any any uh, any ability or interest in joining in this I think American CEOs used to and they stopped they hit a brick wall in the middle 80s this this economy used to be about the middle class growing from the bottom up as being the best thing for all of us and then executive compensation went completely screwy and the average CEO makes 400 times what his or her average employee makes and don't count on them with, with the tax policies that, that enforce that to do the right thing here. 
But we lived for 80 years with an industrial policy, a, a manufacturing policy, that was predicated on a vibrant middle class. And we sold our souls to the financiers and to excessive executive compensation. And this is the consequence of that as well. Bruce? It also seems to me, you know, the definition of what, what Wall Street's economy is has changed. So, uh, uh, I mean, I think if any of us were investment bankers, whether we make a profit in Dubai or in India or in China or in the U.S., uh, it's, it's a profit. And, and basically, if you can make more of a profit investing in China than you can in middle America, uh, all the incentives are there to do, to do that. Um, and I mean, I think one of the one of the real challenges going forward in terms of of what the next administration can do is there are so many things to undo, and each one of them is going to create uh, uh, en enormous tensions and create and require enormous political capital to to undo. I mean, we're talking about issues here that we've talked about for 20 or 30 years, uh, about short-term thinking on Wall Street, uh, which, which you know, reflects reporting requirements on Wall Street. I mean, there's a variety of things, all of which had at least plausible rationales at the time, but we're now kind of paying the consequence of those. And uh, that's why it seems to me we need a broader vision to, to, to drive the political uh, challenges that we're going to face because it, it is going to be extremely difficult without a new vision that gets a mandate uh, to, 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 to spend all the time and political capital is going to be necessary to, to turn this around. You know, quick vi a quick vignette on this. A couple years ago, a few years ago, Bruce may not remember this, but I tagged along with Bruce to a Council on Foreign Relations meeting uh, where Alan Greenspan was speaking. And the focus of being was going to largely Japan and whatever. But he says he made the comment that his job, that he saw his job and Bob Rubin's job and the sort of economic elites as doing what it took to speed up the, 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 uh, the speed and rate by which capital moves around the world and to, to, make, it, to make it efficient and, and, and to kind of move to this turbo and turbo and turbocharged movement. And I remember asking the question that night about, you know, when you raise the speed limit, don't you get more casualties? And what do you do with the casualties? And he was literally dumbfounded. I mean, he was dumbfounded in the response, but hadn't really thought through it. And at the same time, again, as part of this high wage job task force report that we did in the Senate uh, uh, for Tom Daschle and Bingaman, we, we went to an idea that Larry Summers and Joe Stiglitz had written a lot about, which was to try to connect the, the consequences of a high speed turbocharged economy to what could you do to kind of incentivize or create uh, links back to the to the real economy and getting investments where where they were not. And our idea was to create a one half of one percent surcharge on on stock churning that would uh, uh, erode each quarter by uh, uh, twenty five percent down to zero if you held an equity or position for two years. So if you had something for two years, you wouldn't pay anything. If you had it, then you'd have to pay this very small thing. And the amount of money you generated from this from this uh, security stock uh, exchange tax was enormous, given the rates we had. And you could invest in 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 technology, and man, you could you could pay for a lot that would deal with the long-term infrastructure needs of the country, thus making the connection. You can be as short-term as you want, but you're going to contribute and pay, pay your way in. And I'll never forget, I don't know, Joe Merrickson, I don't know if you were in the administration then, but I remember getting a phone call from uh, uh, the Treasury Department, specifically to me, saying when Larry Summers joined the Treasury Department, he changed his mind on that view. Uh, uh, but, but it was, we were in a very, very different mindset that time. At that time, health was frictionless speed uh, movement of capital. That's all that mattered. And the real economy fundamentally didn't. And I think we're, we're, we're coming out of that period. Cheryl? Right. Uh, Bruce mentioned that there's a lot we have to undo. Well, I guess my approach would be to say there's a lot that is being undone right now. And that in some ways we're getting a chance to redo, not redo the initial, but redo it in another way. And one does re relate to to America's dominant financial inst institutions. And so we're at the moment where we should be thinking and have a plan, not just on the technical regulation issues, but how we can in fact reconnect those dominant financial institutions to the real productive economy. Now, it was connected to the real economy in a perverse way over the last 10 years, or six years in particular, or last two or three concentrated, 
because you know one would have not thought that American investment banks would have gotten involved in creating uh, the, the se <coughs> securities based on pieces of, of the home mortgage market throughout <coughs> America, but but they did not with appropriate regulation, and and I you know again I attribute as much of that to the the, the bubble as it was to you know the perversity of Wall Street per, per se because there was enormous excess liquidity, but we were not on the switch in thinking about how you connect uh, that recycling of that liquidity to uh, development banks in the heartland that might help reindustrialize or or capitalize a lot of medium size and new enterprises whether in, in energy infrastructure or manufacturing we weren't thinking about how you you might uh, use those financial institutions and liquidities to build the next the 21st century infrastructure but we now have an opportunity to do that and the danger is there's two dangers one is that we we do get these uh, uh, various kinds of of bailouts and capital and in, in, infusions without the appropriate re-regulation or we also get the infusion of sovereign wealth funds, which we should welcome. But again, the cost is without the re-regulation and without reconnecting our financial institutions to some notion of, of economic strategy or industrial policy for the future. So we have an opportunity to have not exactly a redo, but, but this is a moment and we should, you know, we should be trying to seize it for our agenda. Many yeah. So let me, uh, I've got one time for just one more question. I apologize, Ken. And then uh, quick question, quick response. Quick, quick I promised him by 1.30. what Bruce said about, we've been talking about these issues for 30 years, you know, a decade before. You, you have did, been, yeah. You did the thing with Bingaman. I did the tech, the tech, the uh, trade and competitiveness task force yeah. report. Yeah. did the same thing. But Bruce, you Anybody to, read that one? We got a little bit <laughs> in the <laughs> Trade Act, so a little bit. Um, you used the, a, a key phrase, the vision thing. Right. So maybe it isn't, it's the economy stupid, maybe the real tagline here is, it's the vision. You want to comment on that? Vision versus uh, it's the economy stupid, and final comments from Cheryl, uh, Bruce, and Leo. Um, look, as, as a journalist and a writer, I like vision because it gives me something to write about that's inspiring and interesting and it's not down in the details where no one will pay any attention. Um, you know, as a wonk, I like the details. I'd like to kind of chew on the details. Um, the, if you talk, if, if, if we were political people and not wonks, which is what we all are basically, uh, we would talk about, uh, we would warn against the vision thing because the vision thing gets you in trouble. Uh, it, ca it can potentially, as a politician, overcommit you. It can, it, it can have unforeseen consequences. And while we all think as wonks that, you know, that's all, all uh, uh, politicians talk about is vision, uh, I do think that when, if you, if if a politician were to talk about the vision I would ha have for this for this economy, it would get him in trouble, and I think that's one of the one of the constraints that we that we that we have to acknowledge. I still think they should do it, but I do think that we have to be wary of that as well, even though I support it. Leo, <clears throat> you know I, I I agree with Bruce. I I hope that vision in this election is about change. And, and sufficiently about change that uh, a man who I believe has all the ideas in the world, and that's Senator Obama, will, will find his mandate come January the 21st. He, he, he certainly can, can motivate us towards change. I hope he ends up with a House and a Congress uh, in general that, uh, that give him uh, sufficient opportunities because it's going to be a hellacious hundred days, as, as Bruce and Cheryl and I have been talking about. Cheryl? Sure. Right. I, 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 I do, th do think there is one uneasiness out there amongst the public. It, it's a long-standing uneasiness. It's not one that is that is that is registered in in the polls, and there will be a lot of confusion and befuddlement. But one that I think that actually I may disagree with Bruce that actually I think 
makes the vision more attractive is that I think there's an unsettling effect or feeling a part, a large parts of the American <laughs> public that they took pride in America as being able to produce the best quality goods and services in the world. And they feel now that somehow we've lost that. And they've lost part of America because it, it used to be in their hometown. You could, you could, the best refrigerator used to be made or the, the, the best automobiles used to be, you know, come out of Detroit. And throughout the country, I mean, there's still a pride of that in, the, in where I come from in Nebraska. You know, we th still think we can produce the best corn and, 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 and soybeans, and how, e even, how without hard the, is that? E even without the help of ethanol. Well, it requires a lot of capital these days, unfortunately. But, but I, I think that's, there's a missing sense of lost sense of pride in America as a producer of quality goods and services. In in my mind, just in terms of closing, you know, on this on this uh, uh, subject of, of, of the attention of the American citizenry to the economic issues versus other issues, I was talking at Luce about this the other day. I don't see it in the minds of every American every day. I see a fight going on between Iraq and the war issues and the economy issues. And depending on what's happening on the ground, it's going to flip flop. And it's we've got you know seven eight months more to go. It goes back and forth. And you're going to have uh, 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 you know a dominant narrative out on the on the papers one day that's going to be driven by war, body bags, uh, new commitments, and that. And then the next day you're going to be back on on economic issues going back and forth. But what I find interesting being a as much a foreign policy national security observer commentator as interested in, in the economic issues is when I think about this question of Americans that are befuddled. To some degree, I think Americans subcontracted out to elites the management of this super turbocharged, highly complex economy, just as they subcontracted out to elites the manage of the foreign, you know, the foreign policy and national security portfolios. And now when they come back and they look, there's an enormous amount of frustration and they're not sure why, because they weren't really part of the mechanics or machinery of that. Uh, and the public is looking for binary choices, and it's not getting binary choices. Uh, unless you have the starkness that Leo Hendry just talked about, that might come up. So I think we had a really rich discussion today. I want to thank all of you for joining us. I want to thank Charles Schweninger, Russo, and Leo Henry. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you.